Hi, Vincent Lafrey at Canon Explorer of Light. We're out here in Bryce Canyon, Utah, a really beautiful location. We've been shooting here since sunrise. We're going to shoot through sunset. Now, time-lapse photography has become extremely popular over the past several years, and it's a great way for still photographers to get into capturing motion with their still camera equipment. As we go through the series, you'll see how we approach each sequence in terms of what we decide to shoot, where we place our cameras, what lenses we choose, and why, as well as many of the mistakes we should all avoid in making. As the name suggests, time-lapse is a great way to capture the passage of time. Therefore, I would always recommend you pay really close attention to how things move or change prior to picking your subject, let alone setting up a camera. The key is change and movement. Motion. A time-lapse series of a non-moving subject probably won't work really well. Unless, of course, you've got dramatic light that really changes over time or something really unexpected. Clouds are almost always your friend in time-lapse as opposed to empty blue skies. Those can still work, but things that change in an interesting way or pattern really are often your best bet, and they really help tell that passage of time. So one of the first questions you're going to have in time-lapse photography is how long do you want your final time-lapse video to last? And that's going to determine how many frames you need to shoot, especially given how long the actual event or change is happening. Sometimes it might happen over a 15-minute period, sometimes over an entire day. You need to do a little math to get to this end result, and we're going to talk about our first formula here, our first tip. It's a little complicated, but once you get it down, it's actually pretty logical. Let's say you're going to shoot a subject matter that actually lasts 10 minutes in real time you need to make sure you capture enough frames for it to look smooth in a time lapse. In this case, we need to make sure we capture a minimum of 24 frames per second, which is the standard frame rate for video. So if you decide that your end video is gonna last 10 seconds on screen, you're gonna need a minimum of 24 frames per second to get a good smooth result. What you're gonna do is you're gonna multiply 24 times 10 seconds, and that's gonna give you the minimum needed number of frames, in this case, 240 frames. Okay, so we've decided that we're gonna shoot a time lapse that over a 10 minute period. The first thing you need to do is to turn the minutes into seconds. So 10 times 60 equals 600 seconds. Then divide 600 by the total number of frames we just calculated, which is 240, and that's gonna give us a still every 2.5 seconds. And that's how often you need to shoot a still to get that beautiful end result. Keep in mind that that's your minimum amount of frames that you're gonna shoot. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to shoot a lot more. Why? Things happen, things that are unexpected, and often those lead to the best moments in a time lapse. And you wanna make sure you have a little bit of a buffer in there. You can never really shoot too much in time lapse. The only negative about it is you're gonna run out of disk space and hard drive space. Shoot as much as you can given your CF card or SD card, and obviously given the amount of time you wanna spend in post. So now, let me walk you through an actual example, an actual shoot that we did in Bryce Canyon, where we put a lot of these ideas into action. So in this case, we've got three cameras going. They're actually all 5D Mark III's, um, two of the same lens. We've got one, the 16 over here, the same camera and lens over there. Obviously, one's on a tripod, it's not moving, call that locked off, and the other's on a motorized slider, and we'll get to that in a second. We also have this third camera over here. This is a 5D Mark III with a 24-70-2.8. We've got these intervalometers uh, on each of these cameras. I try to keep them as close as I can to the body so I can see uh, what's running. We're going to go over this intervalometer at one point and show you exactly how it works. Uh, if it's very windy, I would actually tape it to the tripod so it doesn't bang against the tripod continually. So now we're going to move in on the final piece of our puzzle. This is a slider unit. This allows us to move the camera in a very steady motion over time. In this case, we've got a Kessler Cine slider. This allows us to actually move the camera over time. We're pushing it towards a subject, so when you move towards uh, anything, it's called a push. And when you pull back, it's called a pull. When you use card wallets, in terms of everyday use, Every card that is face up in the wallet is ready to go. Every card that's face down or the back side up means it's been shot, don't use it, needs to be copied over. It's a real great fail-safe way of uh, managing your data. It's great to have a little color tape. Uh, you go ahead and put that uh, on the edge of your battery right over the contacts. So you actually can't physically insert it into the camera. This tells us the battery's been used or is dead and needs to be charged. We've got a MacBook Pro with a high-speed USB 3.0. We've got a GTEC drive and a Lexar reader. Uh, with Lexar cards. Uh, on days like this when you're shooting lots of cameras you want fast cards, fast readers, fast hard drives because otherwise you just can't keep up with the amount of data. The reason I chose this location was the incredible amount of depth that we have right in front of us. We've got rocks that are about 15 feet in front of a wide angle lens. Uh, we've got the edge that's about three to four feet. We've got rocks that are 50 feet all the way to infinity and it gives you lots of depth to look at in terms of a move when the camera doesn't push towards a subject. 
Even if the camera's stationary, anything that has a rich layered look will really pop out either in a still photograph, let alone a time lapse or video. Always look for that sort of environment where you have that strong foreground visual anchor and you'll see that your time lapses, films, and even your photographs will really benefit tremendously. To wrap up this introduction to time lapse photography, let's recap some of the key philosophies when shooting. First, look for change and movement. Second, anchor your shots with a strong foreground element. Third, determine the duration of your event. Fourth, Remember, you will need 24 frames per second to obtain smooth movement. And fifth, you can never really shoot too many frames, the only downside being large amounts of data. Be sure to check out the rest of our video series on time-lapse photography as we dig into some of the more technical aspects, successfully shoot and process your time-lapse files. Thanks for watching, and once again, this has Vincent LaFerre, Canon Explorer of Light.